There we are. We're now recording. Um, so in terms of my work and advocacy within the LGBTQ plus community, so it kind of started with, um, if some of you have heard of the charity Stonewall, they're based down in London um, and they're very much about improving gay rights through lobbying um, government and they publish a lot of data reports um, and they um, put out a talent program back in 2011, which seems like a lifetime ago now, but where they invited us down to London to work with um, young LGBTQ plus people and explore how our identities impacted the work that we do and how we could kind of be advocates within our workplaces. So that really started me off and um, it took me back into um, my early role as a teacher and trying to run an LGBTQ plus groups and working with a lot of uh, students that were struggling with their identities um, and while I was doing that I then went on to work with the LGBT Foundation in Manchester which if anyone knows of them they're now a nationwide charity um, that do some fantastic work um, with all different um, elements of the LGBTQ plus community in terms of working from sexual health to mental health. Um, I've worked with their men, younger men's program to begin with and then went on to do, uh, it's called Village Haven, um, which is kind of like a village safety project around the gay village in Manchester um, to do with drugs and alcohol and providing safe spaces for people. And most recently, I was one of their volunteer counsellors during my placement and beyond my placement. Um, so hopefully that's given me enough experiences over the years to be able to deliver some of this material to you. So if I flip it back um, to all of you, I'd like to kind of get a feeling of your experiences of working with LGBTQ plus clients, please. So in the chat, if I could just ask you all to reply, if you could tell me, just a rough number, um, if you know how many LGBTQ plus clients you have worked with to date. Um, and then secondly, how confident do you feel when working with those clients, kind of from the level of I would struggle or I find it difficult, all up to actually I feel really confident. Just leave that for a moment. I'll watch your replies as they stream in. Oh, wow, lots, Tracy. Five. Let's keep some of them. Three. So a real range of experience already coming in, of, of lots of experience and, and not being able to put number two, um, no clients yet, but kind of wanting to build up that confidence. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone who's replied. I'll just minimize that again for a moment. So what's going to happen with, oh, wow, I don't know if anyone else is in Manchester, thunder, lightning and car alarms are not going off. <laughs> it feels like the wind is going to come in at me. Um, so uh, what I was going to say is that, so the way I've hopefully had this session, I will kind of deliver a bit. Um, and then once I've delivered, we'll pause for questions and I can check in with you to see how things are sitting with you, if there's anything you'd like me to clarify or to check out, and then we'll move on to the next section. So if I begin having a look at this idea um, of when we work with LGBTQ clients, when I do this as a classroom session, I usually like to ask kind of my students at the time, you know, do you think it'd be different? And I often get a response of, well, no, I don't think it would be different because I'll use the core conditions and, you know, I'll, I'll explore everything with the client as I would do, which in essence is true. But I usually sit in a position of wanting to kind of say, OK, I agree with you, but I do think that working with LGBTQ plus clients is different than working um, with non LGBTQ plus clients. And a lot of that relates back to some of the experiences that many of those members may have gone through. And I'm just going to talk through some of those experiences now. 
So to begin with, I would say most LGBTQ plus people have a story of coming out. Now, depending where they are in their journey with their sexuality or their gender identity may change where they're at. They may not have, as we say, come out. They may not have shared that um, identity with anyone other than yourself. Um, they may not even choose to necessarily choose that directly with yourself, at least to begin with. Or at the other end of the spectrum, you could have someone that potentially came out many years ago, 10, 20 years ago, um, and is quite confidently out, if I use that term, about their sexuality, they've, they've confided and told people. Um, and I think that that is very, any LGBTQ plus person that I've ever kind of met has a version of this coming out story. Um, and I think that we'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide, but I think is very important to part of their identity. And I think there's a lot to unpack there sometimes for some people. The second thing as well though, to bear in mind is this idea of being out. So um, I think that you can come out. So if I relate to my own experience, you know, I have come out to my parents, you know, my, my sexuality, my grandparents, my wider family, my friends, uh, my colleagues, my students. But actually, in a sense, as an LGBTQ plus person, you kind of have to continuously come out and share your identity for the rest of your life. And if I give you an example of that, if I'm getting a taxi home and I'm in that taxi, I have to do a risk assessment almost in my head to check whether it's safe for me to come out. So if the taxi driver were having, you know, small talk and the taxi driver said, oh, do you have a girlfriend? You know, have you got any kids, anything like that? In that moment, I guess I have to choose whether I come out again. Do I correct the taxi driver and kind of say, oh, actually, yeah, no, I've got a boyfriend. Um, no, I don't have any kids. I'm so awesome. Or do I choose to not respond? Or sometimes if I feel unsafe, do I just kind of go along with that story? Um, and I guess it's something that a member of the non-LGBTQ plus community may not have ever faced before. You don't have to second guess those kind of meaningless conversations in a sense with a taxi driver or with someone in passing. But sometimes LGBTQ plus people have to make that decision. They have to check whether the current situation is safe for them and they want to disclose. Second to that then is this idea of being outed or outing people. So let's say I've started a new job and I might confide in my mentor or I might confide in someone else I work with that, yeah, you know, I live in Manchester, I live with my boyfriend, we've been together a couple of years. Um, I may not necessarily want to share that information with everybody because I may be concerned about the impact that that might have on my job prospects. I don't know kind of how other people may see that. And um, unbeknownst, that, that kind of colleague might go on and tell everybody in the team. Um, that would technically be called outing someone. Um, now, sometimes people can do it um, absolutely non-maliciously. They just think they're sharing information. And there is an argument to be made that if someone is unhappy for that to be shared, that the responsibilities may be on them to say, or, you know, keep this quiet or keep that to yourself. Um, equally, though, unfortunately, there can be the malicious side where someone knows about someone's private life and they kind of use it almost as, as a, a power token to out someone to um, sort of let other people know what their identity is. And you'll often find when I work with younger um, clients that, you know, kind of nasty for the can, like I've, I've had younger people can find their best friend, that they're questioning their sexuality, they're questioning their gender identity, and then that person goes and outs them to the rest of the friendship group, and that can be quite damaging to how they see themselves in their process. Third one is related to repressed identity. So a lot of people um, in the LGBTQ plus community can take a number of years to actually work out their identity and decide what they want to share with the rest of the world. Um, for some people, they can come out um, quite early. You know, I think the world has changed a lot. There's lots of sort of younger children and younger teenagers that are able to come out and have really supportive networks to allow them to do that. But equally, I've worked with clients that maybe haven't been able to come out or haven't realized in a sense their sexuality, their gender identity until later in life, say their 20s or 30s. 
And that repression of an identity for some people can be quite damaging um, and it can lead them to kind of have internalized this idea of not taking up space in the world or minimizing elements of themselves that maybe are less desirable socially. Um, another one is minority stress. So this isn't exclusive to the LGBTQ plus community, um, but minority stress is a stress that's felt by any minority group that um, is quite draining and difficult to deal with in certain circles and can, on top of our normal workload and the normal stresses of life pressures, can take extra impact upon them. So I've got a really good video that I'd like to share with you um, of mosquito bites that kind of um, explains minority stress better probably than I could, I mean, a kind of funnier um, but still quite serious way um, by talking about microaggressions. So I'm going to share that video with you now. It's going to make the presentation disappear for a second. And hopefully you should be able to share, uh, hear the audio coming from this as well. So I'm going to play this in full um, and then come back to the PowerPoint. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping advice. So I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, Can I touch, touch it? Hair? Please. Please. Oh, 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 Can I please? It's fucking oh, annoying. That oh, makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. <laughs> which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try less challenging, Major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. Okay, just going to flip back to the presentation. Hopefully that video was enlightening in a sense to talk about like minority stress and what um, mosquito bites and microaggressions could be. And I know that, you know, I can start my day um, and kind of just be going about teaching my lessons and kind of not thinking and can have what seems kind of like a a, a comment that could be seen as a compliment to someone of like oh I didn't know you were gay or I didn't know this or I didn't know that and it instantly reminds me of my identity and the kind of the impact that that can have for other people. Um, moving on then the obvious in a sense of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia and the impact that that can have upon people. Um, so Thankfully, this has reduced over the years, and I definitely am working in a college environment, um, you know, going from at the height of, oh, that's so gay, oh my god, that's gay, and kind of gay being used as a, a, a word for bad, I've seen a massive reduction in that, and I think that people's general awareness of LGBTQ issues is improving. But unfortunately, I definitely wouldn't say that it's to the point that homophobia, biphobia, or especially transphobia has not disappeared. There are still lots of um, kind of comments that are made, especially just go online, go onto Twitter, go onto Instagram, go onto any social media, and you'll see kind of torrents of hate against LGBTQ plus communities. Um, I would challenge anyone to find an LGBTQ plus person that hasn't experienced some type of homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia in their life. 
Um, struggles with identity as well. So um, often the world wants to know who we are. And I think for um, heterosexual people and those who are kind of settled in the, the gender identity that they were born as, don't really question this too much. Whereas LGBTQ plus people can really struggle to figure out in their own head, first of all, who they are, who they like, who they're attracted to, how they like to express themselves, and then often feel the need to find a way to tell other people what that is. And that can be quite difficult for people, especially if that's fluid and changeable over time. There's religious and cultural tension as well. Um, and there's unfortunately conversion therapy, which kind of the slang of pray the gay away, kind of where religious groups kind of try and help people to become not gay um, through whatever means that may be. Um, I know growing up in Northern Ireland was really difficult for me from a religious point of view. You know, I, I wasn't, my family weren't particularly religious, but religion is everywhere. If anyone's kind of visited Ireland in any way, it's hard to escape it. Um, and it was quite a positive thing for me. I really kind of liked, um, like my, my story is there was, I lived at the top of a hill and there was a little lady at the bottom of the hill that ran a Bible school um, at the summer. And I just knew that as long as I like memorized these my Bible verses, she would give me free stationery. So I would get like pens and pencils and rubbers. And as a kid, like that, who doesn't, I mean, as an adult who loves stationery, as a kid, this was amazing. So actually religion was really positive for me until I started to question my sexuality and started to think about, and all of a sudden, and this isn't, this isn't to kind of hate on any religion anyway, but the God that loved me and you know knew every hair on my head and all the other bits and pieces, suddenly I had I was this kind of sinful horrid person that was going to burn in the, in the fires of hell so that for me and I know that's not the same experience for everyone was kind of added to my level of stress about being an LGBTQ plus person. Um, visibility and invisibility I think is important um, so in terms of if we think about the media, uh, video games, uh, books, everything else LGBTQ plus people over the years haven't necessarily got a really good um, kind of representation, especially when it comes to trans characters. Trans characters up until recently have often been your scary psycho killers. Um, they've often been people to be scared of in society. The same with as kind of gay men tend to be stereotypes of kind of comic relief or overly sexualized. Um, gay women or lesbian women can often be seen as again that the scary lesbian that's kind of with short hair and going to beat people up or kind of put people in their place. Um, so I think either they've been invisible and LGBTQ plus people haven't been able to see themselves in some of that media or and around them as role models as well or what has been visible hasn't been great. Now I think in the last 10 years, this is starting to change massively um, and we are starting to see a shift. But again, if you're working with older LGBTQ plus people, and by older, I mean like 20 plus, not, <laughs> um, that you may find that that has a different story. And sometimes actually having that visibility now can be quite difficult um, because the, a lot of LGBTQ plus people may feel that had they have had that 10, 20 years ago, how different their experience may have been. Uh, laws as well is something to bear in mind that, um, you know, as a gay man, up until very recently, I've not been allowed to donate blood. Um, it's been something that I've just, you know, it's a no. Now, this has recently, and I mean May of this year, it's recently changed um, to, they've changed the forms now to um, not be gender specific about the sexual acts that you've kind of done or not done and whether you can give blood or not give blood. Um, so this is a big change, but for a lot of people, it's still that stigma of years and years of not being allowed and, you know, what that means. Also, um, bear in mind that it's still illegal to uh, for LGBTQ plus people in 69 countries in the world. Um, and that ranges from either sort of just being imprisoned um, up to being put to death. Um, and so it, it's little things. I always kind of say to my friends um, in work, you know, they'll talk about going on holidays and booking things. I said the first thing in my head when we talk about holidays is to Google that country to see whether it's safe for me to go there. Um, so how it could end up, you know, yes, I could stay in a nice fancy resort and it'll be, oh, thanks for that, Sean. <laughs> uh, it'll be 
kind of um, really nice and I'm probably not going to run into trouble but I want to take that risk that if anything does happen that I'm kind of on the wrong side of that country's laws it's kind of a, an extra stress that um, I wish I didn't have and many LGBTQ plus people I'm sure feel the same. Um, getting on to the last one finally one specifically though it doesn't have to be specifically to um, gay men uh, is the HIV and AIDS crisis um, if anyone kind of watched Russell Tovey's kind of documented series of uh, um, how it kind of rocked the LGBTQ scene, it was horrible. Um, there's lots of kind of references back to it. And obviously it's still something that's ongoing. If you're working with um, specifically gay male clients, but it can be wider than that, um, sometimes HIV and AIDS can really have impacted their feelings about sex and their sexuality and about connecting to other men and a health anxiety around that. And lastly, something, um, and this comes mainly from my work with the LGBT Foundation um, in recent kind of years, um, there, there is a, a climbing kind of issue with something that's called chemsex. So if anyone's not heard about this, it's kind of where, um, again, it tends to be specific to or specific to gay men um, or those that identify as men where they will take recreational drugs and go to kind of sex parties that could last anything from one night but to all weekend and you can imagine the mental health impact that that can potentially have we're often seeing it in big cities so being in london manchester um in birmingham there's often people are moving from like smaller cities or places that maybe not being able to express their identity and they're kind of looking to hotwire connection they're looking for something and often if they go on apps like if they go on grinder they'll get invited to these kind of chemsex parties and in a way kind of thinking that that might get give them a boost into the community make them feel part of something in this new city and unfortunately it can often have the opposite impact um, so you may see some of these clients coming and talking about these issues um, and obviously that can link into addiction and things as well so as I present these to you now hopefully you're starting to see a picture of how an LGBTQ plus client might walk in with about 10 more suitcases of baggage potentially to your therapy room than someone that doesn't identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. Now these will show up in all different ways and I'm not trying to kind of label every LGBTQ plus people will have had all of these or had similar experiences, but I think it's definitely something to bear in mind. In terms of how may these impact upon therapy, so as with every client, their expression of these events and their impacts may be and will be unique to them. But I think that understanding the impact of some of these events can have empowers us as therapists to ask questions of our clients related to them. And these questions in turn may help our clients to better understand themselves. I often think that LGBTQ plus people spend so long minimizing their identity that even in the therapy room, they can be scared to show up and be themselves, especially if you don't overtly um, kind of come out and say, I identify within the LGBTQ plus community, which we'll talk about in a moment. But sometimes I think it's our job as therapists to name and label some of these things to almost to begin with, give permission to the client to potentially explore them. So an example that I use within my therapy room is that often, although not all the time, I will use a life graph, as you can see on the right hand side, really common tool for getting to know our clients and um, like kind of what events and experiences they've been through. If I'm working with an LGBTQ plus client, I'll often kind of ask how elements of their sexuality or their gender identity features within this timeline and what impacts they think that that's had upon them. As well as someone who identifies as a cis male, now we're gonna come on to the different terminology that we use. In this instance, cis means the same as. So I was born biologically male. I was assigned male at birth and I still identify as male. So therefore I would call myself a cis male. It's basically the opposite of trans. So if I'm there working as a, a cis male client, uh, or sorry, cis male counselor, and I'm working with a trans client, I might ask something along the lines of, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little more about how your understanding of your identity has developed over this period of time. 
again, in a sense, giving permission or inviting the client to consider that element of their identity. They may choose not to, and that's absolutely fine. And as always, I would kind of say, don't probe or don't push on that. But I think sometimes asking that question can open up brand new avenues. Linked to this specifically as well is being mindful that some of these events that we talked about before may be linked to trauma. And this trauma, unfortunately, may only come to light within the therapy room, as a lot of these events are seen as quite common. And the example that I would use of this is coming out stories. So most LGBTQ plus people have a coming out story, um, turn it into a two to three minute long comedy skit. And if I go down to the gay village in Manchester now and meet someone and they start telling me their coming out story, it'll often be this kind of hilarious thing where, you know, mum kicked me out and my stuff was all over the street. And then I had to go and live with my boyfriend. And that was hilarious because like his mum was mad. And, and it, it's a way kind of to, to distance ourselves potentially from the pain or the emotional content of that story. Um, again, I am generalizing. That's not to say some people may have really gone in there with their stories in a different way. But what I've often found in the therapy room is that by telling that story and us holding that space as therapists that want to help them explore the emotional content of it, that that may be the first time that they've sat with that emotional content and that they've considered the echoes of that story or the echoes of the impacts of what's happened to them so far. So I've got an example in the speech bubble on the right hand side that said, when I heard you telling me um, how your family reacted to your sexuality, I felt a deep sense of sadness. I'm wondering what it felt like for you to share that with me. In guarantee, if I go out to the village with drinks, no one's going to ask that question. They're going to laugh along and we're going to move on to someone else's kind of trauma story, um, masked in comedy humour or, or in some other way. Um, again, I would say I would never encourage therapists to insist that LGBTQ plus clients explore these issues. But one way of affirming our clients would be to ask questions and provide that space to explore them. And the final part of this section, just before I move on to kind of taking questions and maybe um, starting a little bit of discussion, is I think it's really important to own who you are and potentially name your otherness within the therapy room. So if I take an example that wasn't uh, to do with the LGBTQ plus community, uh, one of my favorite therapists is Esther Perel. If anyone hasn't come across her, please Google her, Google her immediately and go and buy all of her things. <laughs> uh, she, she's incredible. She's a couples therapist. Um, one of um, the things I love is her um, podcast, uh, Where Should We Begin? That's on Spotify and Audible and all different apps. Um, and basically she, uh, records sections of couples therapy. And it's really interesting as a practicing therapist to listen to the techniques that she uses. One of them that really stood out to me in particular was that she was working with a husband and wife. As you can see in the picture, Esther is a white woman. Um, in this couple, um, the wife was white as well and the husband was black. And what Esther did very quickly was to name this dynamic and she said something along the lines of I'm wondering how this dynamic is affected by two white women and yourself as a black man directly to the husband. Now Esther talks about this as being transformative because the husband's response was actually this is really impactful on me but I wouldn't have brought that up or mentioned anything because of my otherness to the dynamic in that room and it started very different conversations that we would suggest and Esther suggested were much more vulnerable and were probably more important conversations to have. So if I relate that back to what we're doing this evening I think that it's important for us to be congruent and brave in naming our difference sometimes and asking our clients what it feels like to share that with us, who they may perceive as not being part of that community or even within that community, not being in a particular subset that they're a part of. Um, so I would highly encourage the use of this congruence with LGBTQ plus clients and any client, to be honest, because naming our differences can open up such different and empowering therapeutic conversations. 
One example, again, that I've got on the right hand side is if you are a straight cis woman, so again, this idea, so someone that identifies as heterosexual um, and you were born as female and you continue to identify as female. If you're listening to a gay man speak about his experience of, ke of chem sex at the weekend, might it be important to name that difference and to acknowledge it and ask the client how it feels speaking to you with your identity about those those kind of things and whether there is embarrassment there whether there's shame whether they acknowledge that difference again the client might say oh i, I really don't care who you are like I'd, but equally wow how could that open up and say that was really difficult for me to say and actually there's there's about 30% of the story I've, I've not chosen to share with you because I don't know if it's TMI, too much information or whether. Um, and again, the depth of the therapeutic relationship that we could develop by kind of taking away that embarrassment or taking away that minimization of identity. So I think that that's probably a good moment to summarize what we've covered so far and then pause for some questions. So to summarize what we've covered, Number one, LGBTQ plus individuals often have many extra life events. Acknowledging and understanding these may benefit the therapeutic relationship and the therapeutic work. Number two, these events may be linked to trauma, which may initially be unknown to the client. Acknowledging these empathically with a trauma-informed model may be beneficial. And I'd love to go into kind of trauma-informed practice, but that's an entirely different um, kind of webinar. Uh, but there's lots out there online if you want to look more into that. And number three, own who you are and don't be scared to name the differences between you and your client and ask questions about how they feel about this. So if I can pause there for a moment then, and if anyone has any specific questions that they'd like to ask, I'm thinking just from a crowd control perspective, if you wanna maybe type them into the chat and then we can you maybe unmute yourself and we can have a dialogue about that. Equally, it may not be a question, it may just be a point that you wanna raise or something that you wanna say. Hey, Carrie, I'm interested in the idea of otherness now, how this might create a parallel process in the world outside of therapy. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Carrie, would you like to speak a little bit more about that if you don't mind unmuting yourself? Can you hear me, Neil? Yes, I can. I'm unmuted. Yes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, <winning> yeah, it, <laughs> <laughs> I'm winning. It was just when you were talking about it, it made me think about if we are opening up that dialogue in the therapy room, how the client might then be able to practice that outside of the therapy room and then come back into therapy and talk about what that experience was like for them. Fantastic. Absolutely agree. And I think by almost if we see it as like expanding their self-acceptance and by practicing a safe relationship with you as a therapist of what it's like to really show up if I steal Brene to really be them and inhabit that space that they may be able to then take that out into other relationships that they have is that the kind of thing you were meaning yeah absolutely and really kind of explore that and dig around how safe that is for them in yeah. different situations yeah complete and imagine how many sessions that one question could potentially turn yeah. into <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that, Carrie. Um, let's see, um, Tracy. Interesting way to look at the dynamic. We don't, we would, wouldn't normally share anything about ourselves, but sharing our sexuality might definitely deepen. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that as an LGBTQ plus person, if you're coming forward and sharing that element of your sexuality, I don't want to say that therapists have to share back, but 
it can create such a weird dynamic. If I was working as a client, I didn't know anything about my therapist, about you know what their sexuality was, what their home life in any way was like. I don't know, for me, I can only speak personally, it might reinforce that kind of sense of, of unknowingness. And I might, I think I would choose from my background to hide more of me. I would maybe present a sanitized version of my sexuality and my gender identity because I don't kind of, I, I'm not safe enough to know how to gauge things. Is there anything else, Tracy, you'd want to say on that? Um, no, it is, it is literally that, that we normally, we have this conversation, you know, how much of yourself do you share and when yeah. do you share, when is it appropriate, but it, it just does, as well, it does feel appropriate to, yeah, I'm sharing this with you, and, but it's more about that conversation of how does it feel for you to then share with me? Yes. rather than I, I i i suppose i don't know well, i'm overthinking it now but if it, i identify differently yes then is is that going to be a problem because there was a potential before that i i identified in the same way and now i don't yes. <laughs> so yeah you're kind of taking that away in, in essence in one way i am overthinking it yeah no i don't think you're overthinking it at all i think there's a really interesting conversations to have and i know that you know in in the classroom we talk about self-disclosure and there's so much literature about how fantastic that can be equally there's so much literature saying about hazarding about what do we disclose how much space do we take up as therapists and is that important or not so i definitely think it is something to gauge i guess my personal take would be that if someone is confiding their sexuality and their identity in you that why we don't need to jump in and go oh well actually you know i just want to let you know i'm different and this is what my label is how affirming it might be to just name that from the off and to explore whether you not being the same as them could cause any difference and whether they might feel the need to censor themselves or change anything about how they show up. Definitely, because I think naming that at the beginning, I'm working with a client at the moment. I know one of his sessions he did say to me, he wanted to talk about a new relationship they'd entered into. And it was very much he was asking how I felt about hearing about yeah. the intimate side of that yeah. um which you know at that point that was great because i could say it's absolutely fine you just talk about it I mean, i'm very comfortable with that and he went for it but yeah. yeah it was the fact he needed to ask um yes. so yeah i think that it's definitely something to bear in mind and yeah. um, to bring in a lot earlier yeah, definitely fantastic. thank you so much a really good example as well tracy because again i think there can be potentially an embarrassment for some clients about talking about intimacy and sex and and specific acts or you know and there's always that line of what what is too much information what do I need to share I think for LGBTQ plus people it can be that extra level of oh you really don't want to hear about this or you know this person the presumptions they might have of us so to for me to level that playing field and say let's talk about that difference you perceive to see what assumptions they may have made about us Great, thank you. And then Shauna, uh, thank you Neil for sharing your experience of simple act of booking a holiday. Yeah, my wife and I share that experience. I think it's something that people outside the LGBTQ plus unit. Yeah, absolutely. It It's something that I think there's so many things that LGBTQ plus people do to kind of, if I use the us to keep ourselves safe, that just are so automatic, are so routine that until someone else picks it out and says, what, you do what? Why are you doing that? Oh, that's, and then you suddenly think, oh God, yeah, you don't have to consider that. And and there's so many moments of that um, that I think that I guess are interesting to think about. Um, and we'll come on to later that the idea of like heteronormative privilege in the world that we brought up in and what that impact that can have. Right, I think that's all the questions that I've had for this section. Thank you very much, everyone that's shared and that's. Um, kind of added to this. So I'm going to move on then to our second point. Um, so that is terminology and definitions associated with the LGBTQ plus community. So one fear that I often hear from colleagues a lot is, oh, I'm terrified to say the wrong thing. You know, I, I go in with the best intentions, but I'm really scared that I'll muck it up and that I'll say something that's hugely offensive, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and my response to that is always this idea that while working with the majority of the LGBTQ plus community and clients, 
I think they'll be more than keen to explain their identity and what the terminology means to them. Um, I do think though that some knowledge of the basic terms is really helpful. And like anything else that we would work with, if we work with a, a specific client foot um, base, whether that be a specific mental illness, be it a specific area of the community, um, then I think that having that basic knowledge is important. So I'm going to run through some of these terms. Um, and again, if uh, you just, if you want to make a note, if you're unsure of any that I use or you want me to clarify, I've got a, a spot for questions at the end um, and you can definitely check that out with me. So we'll start with ACE or asexual. Um, so I've had a number of clients and students that identify as this, and it's an umbrella term that's used specifically to describe a lack of varying or occasional experiences of sexual attraction. Typically, those who identify as asexual, as opposed to ace, do not experience sexual attraction at all. Now, within the LGBTQ plus community, and like a lot of society, you can imagine like how much is sex sold and how much is our culture sexualized in general. In the LGBTQ plus community, especially as a gay man, sex is everything. You know, everything revolves around it, all the spaces for gay men in some way tend to be linked back to sex. So if you imagine being part of a minority in which sex is really important, and then suddenly you're a sub minority in which you don't experience that sexual attraction in any way, that, that promotes more otherness and can make people feel really isolated um, and almost have to come out within the community that they've come out to. Now, these people can have romantic attractions, they can want to seek relationships with people, but when it comes to sex, they just have no interest whatsoever. If you're interested in more of this, I think Channel 4 did a documentary not that long ago. It's on oh, whatever that player is called. Now it used to be called 4OD. I think it's like all four or something now, but it's on there. If you just type in asexual, it'll come up. It's really interesting to hear from different people's perspective of how they experience it and what it means to them. An ally, I would like to say to everyone here today that's joined um, our seminar this evening, thank you for giving up your time because it's an example of allyship and being an ally. Typically how it's used is for a straight and or cis person, so someone, again, that their identity is the same as their biological sex at birth, who supports members of the LGBTQ plus community. Bi or bisexual is used to describe a romantic and or a sexual orientation towards more than one gender. And traditionally it's used for um, women who are attracted to men and women and men who are attracted to men and women. Some people now use it as a wider spectrum and they use bisexual to basically mean that they're attracted to any person regardless of how they identify. We've talked about this a little bit, but just to kind of go on, excuse me, in a little bit more. So this comes a lot, the biggest question I get is around cis, like what the hell does cis mean? Or what cisgender, this weird, and it does, to me, it sounds very medicalized. It doesn't sound, without, it doesn't sound nice to say. It sounds like I'm, I'm casting a spell, <laughs> like cisgender. <laughs> but it, it basically is a term to identify non-trans. So if we're gonna separate out, if we're gonna say that you are a trans male or you are trans female, we need terminology for someone that wants to identify as non-trans. So another way of doing that is cis, and it goes back to kind of Latin terms. So someone whose gender identity is the same as the sex they were assigned at birth. So non-trans is also sometimes used, and it is not, I've never come across anyone that's found that saying non-trans is offensive. Um, so e.g. if you were born male and you still identify as male, you may define yourself as a cis male or a trans person may refer to you in that way to be able to simply find linguistic terms to talk about that difference. Dead naming, this is a really important one. So dead naming is calling someone by their birth name after they have changed their name. This term is often associated with trans people who have changed their name as, as part of their transition. And just as a special note, it can be, and I would go as far as say is really offensive to ask a trans person for their previous or their dead name. 
Now, if a client brings multiple identities to the therapy room, I definitely would not be scared to explore those identities. If they say, you know, I was born as Neil and, you know, I lived in that identity until I was 16 and then I changed my, um, I started identifying as um, gender fluid and I changed my name to Crystal or I changed it. I wouldn't say I wouldn't avoid exploring that because the client's brought it to you. But if the client doesn't bring it to you, please don't ask for that name because that can be really offensive and can be really triggering and related to the trauma of what that means to that person. Um, another term that's quite popular, especially with younger people when I work with them is called demisexual or demiromantic. This is an umbrella term used to describe people who may only feel sexually or romantically attracted to people with whom they've formed an emotional bond. People may also use this in conjunction with terms such as gay, bi, lesbian, straight, queer, um, and in conjunction with Demi to explain the direction of romantic or sexual attraction as they experience it. So for example, I could say I'm a gay man, but I could also further define myself as demisexual. What that would mean is basically that I'm not into hookup culture, that I wouldn't want to just go on an app and find someone and go around and sleep with them, that I would want to form that um, emotional bond with them before I would consider having any kind of sexual relationship with them. Right, gender dysphoria. So this is a term that is used to describe when a person experiences discomfort or distress because there's a mismatch between their sex assigned at birth and their gender identity. It's also a clinical diagnosis for someone who doesn't feel comfortable with the sex they were assigned at birth. One common misconception is that not all trans people experience gender dysphoria. So I think sometimes it's assumed that if you are trans, you must be gender dysphoric. You must be uncomfortable with your um, the sex that you were born as. And sometimes that links to sort of really disliking your body. You know, if you were uh, trans, trans female that hadn't had any um, operations, um, you may be very um, unhappy with your genitals. And that would be labeled as gender dysphoria um, or could be, so I should say, labeled as gender dysphoria. Equally though, um, often clients have said to me, look, I'm not gender dysphoric. I'm really happy physically with the body I'm in, but this is how I identify. Gender expression as well is how a person chooses to outwardly express their gender within the context of societal expectations of gender. A person who does not conform to societal expectations of gender may not, however, identify as trans. There are different ways. So um, someone may choose some days to present it, their gender expression in the masculine way and choose what societies define as masculine, you know, jeans and a t-shirt. However, they may another day choose to express their gender in a more feminine way. They may wear a skirt or they may wear a blouse or something that traditionally would be seen within the gender norms of uh, femininity. That doesn't necessarily mean that person is trans. It may just be how they're choosing to express the gender at that time. Um, and gender identity itself is seen as a person's innate sense of their own gender, whether male, female or something else, which may or may not correspond to the sex that they are assigned at birth. So someone's gender identity is very personal to them in terms of how they feel about themselves. A really good tool to explore this with clients is something called the gender unicorn. And in other sessions, um, that's something that I would go into more in detail. You can literally Google if you want to make it up for yourself, gender unicorn. It'll bring up this really pretty little picture of a, a colorful unicorn and different spectrums to do with masculinity, femininity. Um, it's really good for working with younger clients as well. Uh, intersex. So this is a term that's used to describe a person who may have the biological attributes of both sexes or whose biological attributes do not fit with societal assumption about what constitutes male or female. Intersex people may identify as male, female or non-binary. So I have had a client before who was born with both a womb and a penis. Um, and so therefore identified themselves as intersex and then went on later to identify themselves as male. 
Non-binary um, is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity doesn't sit comfortably with man or woman. Non-binary identities are varied and can include people who identify with some aspects of binary identities while others reject them entirely. Some people just do not like a label. Some people, if they you know, wake up one day and they choose to express their gender in a certain way, more traditionally masculine or feminine, they prefer not to sort of um, have to fit within that, today I'm a man, tomorrow I'm a woman. They prefer just that fluidity. Pan or pansexual, again, really popular term. Um, and this is one that often is kind of moving into bisexual now as well. Um, they're almost interchangeable. And that refers to someone whose romantic and or sexual attraction towards others is not limited by sex or gender. They are attracted to anyone, almost that, don't mean it in a cliche way, but I'm attracted to the person, not what genitals they have, not how they express themselves. Um, so traditionally bisexual would have meant I am a man who's attracted to those who identify as man or those who identify as woman, like male and female, but maybe would not include trans within that. Um, whereas pansexual was seen as including trans and queer identities and kind of basically that idea of cover all in a sense. Queer, now this is a, um, I almost want to say controversial topic, but I guess I say that simply because it depends on your client and what that word means to them. So I might have older clients and I have I've worked with an older client who was very much, I am a gay man and queer was an insult that used to be chucked at me. And I actually find it quite offensive when people identify as that because that's hurtful to me. Equally, I've had a younger client who loved the word queer because they didn't want to identify as being a lesbian or as being um, some other kind of specific. And they wanted to kind of say, I am what I choose to be and I don't need to tell you what that necessarily is. And queer covers that. Um, so there's this idea that queer has almost been reclaimed as a positive term by the LGBTQ plus community. So if I just read, queer is a term used by those wanting to reject specific labels of romantic attraction, sexual orientation and or gender identity. It can also be a way of rejecting the perceived norms of the LGBTQ plus community, racism, sexism, ableism, etc. Although some LGBT people view the word as a slur, it was reclaimed in the late 80s by the queer community who have embraced it. Um, trans then is an umbrella term to describe people whose gender is not the same as or does not sit comfortably with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Trans people may describe themselves as using one of more of a wide range of terms, including but not limited to transgender, transsexual, gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary, gender variant, cross-dresser, genderless, agender, non-gender or third gender. There will be a test and you need to, <laughs> no, there won't. Um, basically, what I would say with trans people is, as, as someone who is cis, as someone who's not trans, the most kind of, um, the safest way to use it is simply to use trans as an umbrella term. So if I am doing a session on um, working with people in the trans community, I'll use the word trans. Because to some people, if I use the word transsexual, if I use the word cross-dresser, if I use the words genderless, it's not how they see themselves and they can potentially be offended by this. Trans is the accepted kind of umbrella term that covers the rest. When I've worked with trans clients, they will often tell me what way they like to define themselves. Um, so for example, um, uh, one of my clients in particular um, used, like to refer to themselves, and for me, it's almost a, a personal judgment, like they use the word tranny as like, I was, I'm either a tranny or I'm a transvestite, that's who I am, and that's like how I like to identify, that's what I was in the day, and I don't like the new terms that the kids have come up with. And so obviously, to honour that, that's the terminology that we used. Would I use that terminology with the trans community in general? No, not a chance. But for that um, client, it was really important to honour that's the word, that's how they wanted to identify and to stick with that. Let me just check, I've just got a message, apologies. Not a problem, um, Jimmy, thank you very much for coming along. And yet the recording, as far as I'm aware, will be sent out to everybody. Um, okay, transitioning. 
The steps a trans person may take to live in the gender with which they identify. Each person's transition will involve different things. For some, this involves medical intervention, such as hormone therapy and surgeries, but not all trans people want or are able to have this, and it is not a requirement. I remember in um, one of the trainings, training sessions that I went to, um, the, the trainer kind of said, okay, uh, can you please sort of take a moment and write down when does someone become trans? And it kind of stumped us all because we started to think, you know, there was, is it when someone decides to go and have surgery to change their genitals? Is it when someone start, you know, legally changes their name? Ultimately, it's the same as anything else in the Equality Act. If they decide that's their identity, that is instantly their identity. So someone is trans as soon as they decide that they want to um, express themselves in a way that is different than the biological sex that they were born. They don't need to have had surgery. They don't need to change legal documents. Um, it can also be an identity that I would suggest, especially with some of my clients, perhaps is only exists within that 50 minute session to begin with at least while it's a safe place for them. Transitioning might also involve things such as telling friends and family, dressing differently and changing official documents. But again, I guess what I, I really want you to take home is that none of those are a requirement, you know, and some trans people um, are very happy to not change anything. You know, it's an identity that they want to express that may be very private for themselves and they still associate themselves with the identity of being trans. Further terms and definitions can be found on Stonewall's website. So the link is if you literally just type in Stonewall and glossary of terms, um, it will come up for you. I've picked out kind of the most popular ones, but there are many more that are there for you if you are interested. So I guess the bit that I kind of come, came to this is some people after I go through these definitions that when I do this in the classroom, I see the faces of terror come up as they've like rapidly scribbled down every term and they kind of look down and think, how in the hell am I going to remember any of those? I've already forgot the one that you said three slides ago. Um, what I would really say is try not to be intimidated by the terminology. These terms do change all the time. And when I was working with um, young people, especially um, in the LGBT groups in college, every week they would find some new term that they'd read about on a forum or they'd chatted about or they'd seen on TikTok that they were now using as if it was their own. And I would be sat there going, huh? <laughs> like, please, can someone take a moment to explain this to me? And generally, that's a really positive thing. It's like, oh yeah, Neil, like this is what this is. And this is like, I really identify as this. I see myself within this now. So I guess it comes back to an extensive knowledge of these terms is not as needed. There will not be a test on these. Um, but I do think that understanding some of them are important. And especially, I guess the message behind it is that LGBTQ plus people often can struggle with their identity. They can struggle to figure out how they fit in, where they are within society. And these labels can suddenly kind of give them a voice and give them something to say, oh, this is me. This thing talks about a tribe or a culture of people that I am a part of, that I've never felt a part of something before. So these labels can be really empowering for our clients. So recognizing them um, and utilizing them can be really helpful. If you ever struggle, I always just say as a tip, kind of just use reflection and open questions. I've got that at the bottom of, uh, Neil, I heard you use the term demi-romantic. Could I ask what that term means to you? Because again, every LGBTQ plus person could interpret that in different ways. And maybe your Stonewall definition is different than how they see themselves. So it's always worth checking out. Finally, I'd say on this point before I move back to questions is stay informed. So while it's great to ask our clients what certain terms mean to them or about the experiences they've had, we need to be mindful of not relying on our clients to educate us. Um, and I would say this is particularly important when working with trans clients. Often when I've been doing, not as a therapist, but when I've worked with different uh, events that uh, around sort of trans awareness and what we can do, a lot of trans people have kind of relayed back that 
they there was an element of sharing them that was kind of nice to be able to do but all of a sudden people got really fascinated and interested in them be the healthcare workers or therapists or you know and started going to ask loads of questions that they ended up being a bit of an encyclopedia of what that meant as opposed to being able to sit within their own experience of that so just like working with any other topic, I would encourage you to Google around any phrases or ideas or ways that clients express themselves to keep yourself more informed. It may never come up again, but it's something that, again, is a way of you recognizing the importance of that for your client. So if I just summarize this section um, into a few bullet points, many members of the LGBTQ plus community use titles and definitions to express their identity. A knowledge of the most common terms can help to demonstrate your desire to be an LGBT plus affirmative counselor. The amount of times that someone has said to me, oh, I, I identify as Demi, and I've been able to kind of nod and, and they, they recognize I actually know what that means, and there's almost like a light that goes on in their eyes of like, oh, they really get me. It's not just they're not a nice person that wants to. Um, number two, we will get all or we will all get things wrong. Don't be scared to ask your client to explain what a certain term means to them specifically. Again, it could open up a whole new therapeutic conversation. And lastly, try not to rely on your client as a continual source of education. Read around key terms and topics that are coming up, just like you might do with any other topic that's brought that's not related to a specific community. Okay, I am going to take a breath <laughs> um, and I'm going to pass it back then to yourselves. Again, if we use the same format, if you'd like to add anything, a comment, or if you'd like to ask a question or have anything clarified, if you put it in the chat for me, and then I'll use that to kind of have a chat with you. Um, let's have a look, uh, great talk there for, all right, thank you very much Ingrid, I really appreciate you taking part, and if you do want to watch the rest of it, I think the link will be sent out, um, but if not, thank you so much for giving up your time this evening to listen to what we've covered so far. Um, Dan, I don't have a specific uh, question now, but I think it's a very good point about finding balance and not being a know-it-all, yeah, absolutely, as it can take away from the individual experience, etc. Oh, Fab, thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's so important that we're not kind of using it as a platform to kind of say, oh, well, I actually know what this term means. <laughs> um, but actually, we're kind of, it's that, isn't it the sort of implicit knowledge that we have, but also checking it out. Thank you for that comment. And I, I really thank you for giving up your time this evening to listen in. If I give about another 30 seconds or so, I think my cat has snuck in. She has. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, Okay, so we'll, we're going to do, um, there are, in terms of presentation, there are two more sections. I'm only going to do time-wise, run through one more little section, and I've got a really um, powerful video to show you to kind of finish off, and then we'll use the last kind of half hour or so if people can stick around for any final kind of discussions, takeaways, and points that you may want to go through. Um, Let's see, Sarah, thank you for in parallels with fertility clients and around identity and minority stress. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I think there are so many parallels with any kind of niche area or any um, specific community. Um, is there anything else, Sarah, that you'd like to say about that? Um, I think just linking the two together, though, um, as a fertility uh, counsellor, you know, obviously with, with this community, 
it's obviously the more fertility services there are there now yeah the two are very linking in so it's very so much more compacted as well yes. you know especially when you've got the community going in and sitting in a waiting room before covid obviously yeah and, and there's couples in there you know straight couples sitting there looking at them thinking oh yeah look at those kind of thing and, and it was Absolutely. very much that way and that way it's really quite hard so there's that being outed already before they've even walked in the door completely and how much i imagine that every couple that is sitting in that waiting room is going through so many levels of stress and emotional um, kind of pressure and anxiety to have that extra layer of what are how are we going to be judged you know how are the healthcare professionals going to see me how are the other people going to see me you know after if, if all goes well um and we have children what kind of what how are we going to be received how's our how's our child going to be treated in the classroom in different groups i think that is something for lgbtq plus parents that potentially is lifelong for them and already the stress and pressure of being a parent to add that on top is a, a kind of an extra level yeah definitely and also against um i'm an adoptive parent but i've worked you know worked with other adoptive parents as well from yeah. the community as well and it's the same for them as an adoptive parent you know when you go to the teddy bears picnics when you do all that kind of thing there's there's all that as well absolutely and thank you for that sarah it comes back to that whole thing of, of having to re-out yourself you know you never kind of get to sort of be at that position where the whole world is informed of your identity and we're all okay with it you have to kind of check your safety think about the impact that will have it it's all these extra kind of thought processes and takes up potentially so much more space in lgbtq people's heads mm, yeah definitely and, and thank you for what you've given so far no, thank you very much sir i appreciate it um, let's have a look. Tracy says, oh, I have on a couple of occasions wondered whether a client may be struggling to acknowledge their sexuality, but haven't wanted to specifically ask if their question are leaving them to raise it themselves. What are your thoughts on asking the question whether they may never have said it out loud before? I think if I'm honest, Tracy, I would find that really difficult as well. I think that um, often there can be a real power in labeling something both ways it can be really empowering for someone to be able to say out loud i am gay i am lesbian i am pansexual but equally there can be a terror and there can be almost an element of if i say this it makes it real and it takes it to a different place that maybe a client is not ready for i wouldn't really it's not going to be helpful but kind of give blanket advice i would say that I would definitely take that one to supervision. And I think that's one where I would say, I have I have on occasions asked, if I'm thinking about my clients and thinking about if they're questioning their sexuality, or their gender identity, if I've been kind of built up a good therapeutic alliance with them and I felt they've taken other challenges quite well and we've done something with that, I'll maybe use that as my gauge to say, I'm going to go in and I'm going to, I will often, if I'm ever going to say anything that I think is particularly challenging, I will ask the client, first of all, if they wouldn't mind if I pose them a question that might be quite challenging um, and see what they want to do with it. I've always had clients say, yeah, go for it. You know, like they're quite up for it kind of being challenged, but um, at least that gives them the option. And I'd say ultimately a client I guess can just kind of shut you straight down if they're really not comfortable they'll just tell you no and they'll not label it whereas maybe by you inviting them and creating space it could encourage them to have that brave moment of, of saying it out loud um so i think a muddy answer of i would judge it by each client in terms of where you're at does that help and not help at the yeah. same time <laughs> well <laughs> kind of <laughs> But yes, I, again, it's, I said at the beginning, it's it's about, you know, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I withholding the question or asking yeah. the question? And actually what you're saying is there is no right answer. It's, yeah. it's yeah, judge it based on how it feels in the moment. So that's that's actually very useful. <laughs> Muddy as it was. So and a really, again, a really good question where our kind of fear could often 
I don't know, like um, my mum's advice is always like, if, if you're not sure, do nothing. <laughs> just, and that's kind of sometimes what I live by. And it, it, sometimes that can paralyze us with stuff that we don't know when we are a bit more informed, we can maybe be like, okay, do you know what? No, thinking of, again, if we go back to moral qualities, of like I'm thinking that this is beneficent, that this is in my client's best interest and I'm trying to help them. This is where I'm coming from and see what maybe our supervisors think and if there's anything going on for us as well. Great question, thank you. Okay, everyone, let me go back then to the presentation and let's do this kind of third and what will be for tonight, the final section, um, which will be um, some data about LGBTQ plus communities and the adversities that they may face. So unfortunately, the physical and mental health outcomes for many LGBTQ excuse me, plus individuals isn't a pretty picture. Um, and given the number of life events that we've discussed so far within the presentation, it kind of maybe doesn't come as a massive surprise that these life events can often have adverse impacts upon LGBTQ people's um, mental health and also their physical health. Now, I would say that this isn't specifically because these people are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, or, uh, or other, um, it's because of like societal or society's reaction to that and where we're kind of at with our acceptance or non-acceptance of those identities. So Stonewall is one of the best sources. If you're ever asked to put together a presentation, if you're ever asked for some kind of um, impact upon um, sexual expression or gender identity you can have, Stonewall have the reports for you. I'm not going to read through them all this evening, but there are three major um, reports I think that are particularly interesting. The most recent one is by Stonewall was LGBT in Britain, the health report in 2018. And just to read some of the headlines of that, it's that half of LGBT, P, uh, LGBT people, which is 52%, said they've experienced depression in the last year. Huge statistic. One in eight LGBT people aged 18 to 24, so 13%, said that they've attempted to take their own life in the last year. Almost half of all trans people, 46%, uh, have thought about taking their own life in the last year. Really sad statistic. 41% of non-binary people said they harmed themselves in the last year and one in six LGBT people, 16%, said they drank alcohol almost every day over the past year. Again, another kind of, if we say comorbidity of the LGBTQ plus community is addiction and alcoholism and drug use tends to be a lot higher in the LGBTQ community than it is in other communities. One in eight LGBTQ plus people um, aged 18 to 24, 13% took drugs at least once a month. And one in eight LGBT people, 13%, have experienced some form of unequal treatment from healthcare staff because they're LGBT. In terms of looking at the work report, um, again, published by Stonewall, um, within the workplace, almost one in five LGBT staff, 18%, have been the target of negative comments or conduct from work colleagues in the past year because of their LGBT identity. One in eight trans people, or 12%, have been physically attacked by customers or colleagues in the last year because of being trans. I think that's a really sad statistic to think that it's kind of going beyond a, um, a slur, which is bad enough, but to kind of physical abuse. Um, one in 10 Black, Asian and minority ethnic LGBT staff, 10%, have been similarly physically attacked because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, compared to just 3% of white LGBT staff. So we start to get into this kind of minority within a minority that um, kind of uh, without getting into that whole idea of kind of white privilege and again the idea that ethnic minorities will experience sexuality um, kind of in terms of sorry its impact upon them can be even more marginalized and can kind of bring them even more to the fringes of, of kind of the norm of what's ex ex uh, accepted and expected within society. Um, Almost one in five LGBT people, 18%, who were looking for work said they were discriminated against because of their sexual orientation and or their gender identity while trying to get a job in the last year. And almost two in five bi people, 38%, aren't out to anyone at work about their sexual orientation. 
I think with bisexual people in particular, if they are with an opposite sex partner, it can often be almost like too much work to have to explain that actually that's not how they identify. And equally, you can get a lot of biphobia from within the LGBT, well, the LG. TQ community, as in people who identify as bi. Um, if, for example, if I take, so if I identified as bi, gay men may want me to sort of say, no, you're not bi, you're gay, you know, just kind of come out of the closet, admit that you don't like women as well. Equally, that can go on the other side. Um, so biphobia is um, actually quite prevalent, even within the community itself. And lastly, the school report. Um, I'll just read a few of these. Nearly half of LGBT pupils, 45%, including 64% of trans pu pu pupils, are bullied for being LGBT in Britain's schools. This is, is down 55 um, from 55% of LGBT pupils, or LGB pupils, sorry, lesbian, gay and bisexual, who experienced bullying because of their sexual orientation in 2012, and 65% in 2007. So the positive message here is that it is reducing, and schools are starting to do a lot more, and still more has been a big part of getting these resources out there and helping schools to recognise their need to educate and to change, but it's still not a great um, stat when we're looking at almost half of all of those students being bullied um, for their identity. Um, and half of LGBT pupils hear homophobic slurs frequently or often at school, which is down from seven in 10 um, in 2012. So again, a move in the right direction, but perhaps not quite enough. Okay. So to summarize um, these statistics in a sense, LGBTQ plus individuals are more likely than non-LGBTQ plus individuals to experience poorer mental health outcomes. While this is not directly related to their sexuality or their gender identity, it's often a result from their mistreatment within society. Whilst improvements have been made, society is still a long way off from acceptance. Understanding and acknowledging that LGBTQ plus clients have more adverse experiences in the world may help with empathy levels within the therapeutic process. And lastly, every LGBTQ plus individual will have different life experiences. However, appreciating the commonality that everyday experience, such as holding a partner's hand or displaying affection in public, may be very different for LGBTQ plus clients, and this is important. Now, um, I've got a little uh, movie that I'd like to show you. It's only, it's about four and a half minutes long, um, and it's called A Time for Love, shot in 2018. It has some hard hitting elements to it, um, but I think that it really conveys, both on a micro and macro level, the experience that some LGBTQ people can go through um, just in living their everyday lives. So I'm going to flip across to that now and hopefully that will play out for you and you'll be able to hear it as well. Give me a second just to change to that. Okay, I'm going to play this video through now. It's Glasgow, March, and we walk hand in hand in the park. Now it's 3.13 and I'm late and it's time I make a choice. We're both boys, you see. If you were to go back and look, you'd see a hundred eyes hurry to objectify this hand in hand stance. It's a flurried dance of reaction. Some smile, they're proud and they want me to know. But there's a darker shade of brow that balances the books. The kind of look that challenges, like this is some chess game and I'm in check and I'm second guessing what they might do next. Point me out to all the pawns in the crowd. Spawn a following whose glowers linger on so that our hands are no longer holding, but dragging glare after glare, snowballing stairs, stretching elastic social disgrace through this forbidden space and the scales are well and truly tipped. Now it's 3.14. Glasgow March 2018, and I have to make a choice. Have you ever wondered how to say goodbye, you know, to a friend's mum, do you go in for a kiss on the cheek, to a colleague, neighbour, do you hug them, or shrug them off? What if that neighbour is your lover? What if there's no other way to say goodbye than the one you know will send outcry burning through the matchstick men and women who love to strike up ideals? I'm a walking meal for the mouths of normality. What does that mean, exactly? We're normal, 
he says with his frown. But under his wife's dress and flesh is an unborn baby, blessed with one more hour of air before she miscarries and they carry that grief with them to the grave. And they're not normal anymore. They're changed and aching. And that old man, I make him sick, but he writes to Japan at the weekend to get a friend to send the used knickers he can vend from a machine there for completely normal purposes, of course. See, normality is a crowdsourced fantasy, but it turns every single silent person in this park into an enemy. Teenage boys blunder ahead, how much thunder are they carrying in their heads? They should probably be at school, drawing straight lines, sprinting in straight lines, thinking in straight lines, and when the bell rings, it's no wonder they want to straighten out anything that curves or bends. Or her, with the rolling chips and the kids, she'd take one salty glance at two guys kissing, be hissing, vinegar, or way I up get nothing against gays, she'd say, but you, you have, have to, to do it in front of my kids. kids. And she runs away. They never do stay long enough to look you in the eyes. In a Bible bash or rehashing lies about Jesus, like how Poundland rip off mini cheddars and sell them on as cheese savouries, because it seems to me like Jesus saved a lot of time when he died for all our crimes that he would have wasted teaching small minds that love is no sin. See him, he thinks it's faith, but under all that din, it tastes like cardboard and it smells like hate. And I may sound angry, but I'm just scared because in the midst of this and this and that, there's one person I'm not looking at. Because a face looks different in the daylight than in the night, where at least there's no one staring. You're always wearing worry lines and looking at the time, because the last train home is always waiting. Because this should be a small choice, and there's all this noise in my head. I should be holding a hand, and I'm holding shame instead. But I'm letting go. No, I won't keep weighing it up. I'll put my muscles at ease. And they're 30% of my mass, by the way. I'm a homo sapien. Elbows, knees, 60% water flooding, 7% blood rushing, and half a percent beating heart. So why is a goodbye kiss no walk in the park? Half a percent doesn't sound like much, but it's enough. It's 3.15 Glasgow March 2018 after all. You'd think it was just about time for love. Okay, okay everyone, hopefully that video kind of reflected some of the experiences that LGBTQ people can go through with something that you may have never questioned, you know, if you um, kind of haven't come from within that community of just holding someone's hand and that the declaration that that can potentially make or the impact that that display can have on other people around you. So let me open it back up for any reflections that people may have or any questions that people um, may want to pose. Um, and then I can just kind of move on to a, a kind of final like sort of tips and, and summary of the session to close out. So again, final time if people want to use the chat function to, you don't have to type the whole thing. If you just have a question, you can say I've got a question, we can talk about it, we can have a kind of less formal dialogue in a sense. Um, Alison, in my recent experience of school, gay is used as a term of abuse for any boys who are seen as different. Yeah. Alison, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yeah. that? So I'm a parent of a bisexual daughter and a, mm -hmm. a boy who was too young really to have identified yet. So we, within months really of her coming out, we were having Leviticus quoted at us by somebody in the church she was going to, yeah. told she couldn't be baptized or which she wanted to be because she would have to renounce her faith or renounce her relationship she was in a relationship and somebody from Ireland was saying well when I was young I had to 
renounce my views. I think he was from Northern Ireland. I'm, yeah. I have to be honest, I find this really hard to watch. I've cried through a lot of this. It's mm, really, I, I cannot believe the level of prejudice that I have met in a middle class area of Manchester. My seven year old, it might have been eight, came home and said, Mum, what's a paedophile? Yeah. This, and it's just been off the chart. Yeah. And it staggered me. I work with adopters and I've seen prejudice from people who really should have known better, just yeah. unquestioning, not considering things. And yeah. I found it difficult to advocate for people because some of the views are so ingrained that, and people who felt they haven't got judgment, but clearly have. Yeah. I've been absolutely, you know, blown away by what I've seen. It, it feels, it makes me so angry. It's really hard to know how to manage it. Yeah, no, and, and thank you for expressing that, Alison, because I think that it is really sad because I, I kind of think the same. I live in Manchester and my idealised version of it is that it's like a gay mecca that kind of all oh, though, is it? Kind of LGBTQ people go into. If I go five metres down from the gay village, if I'm out on a night out, there's a good chance I'll get a homophobic slur thrown at me or if I hold my partner's hands, I could get beaten up. You know, I've got friends recently that kind of were kind of abused on the tram on their way home um it is really sad um I I guess the only not in no way to fix it but I guess to counter it though is that I think that there are so many people that want to be LGBTQ plus affirmative and do want to challenge those views and I think as more people come out I think everyone starts to know someone that is close to them and if that is what causes them to change their views and opinions and have to redress those beliefs because it becomes more familiar it becomes less scary and less different then it, it does become more of a positive but that there's a I'm with you Alison there's a massive battle to still fight and I think it links back to when working with LGBTQ clients I think sometimes there can be a belief that we've progressed a lot as a society that a lot of that work's kind of been done and we, we've won that battle and oh, I, I kind of would you know would pose that that trauma is still very much there very. And, yeah. and so very traumatizing for young people still coming oh, through massively. you know Absolutely. eight years old what's a paedophile because that was something that another child had said to him at the school so and sad. and being 14 now and yeah. recently still somebody says oh you're a gay boy and it just never ends. <laughs> um, I don't think he knows whether he's gay or straight. It's not, that's not, uh, which isn't the issue, but it's just, and then of course, if he was questioning his sexuality and those things are said to him, where does he start? Anyway, it's so difficult. And I think that's where, I think I, I, if we are informed, I, I'm not a parent myself, but in terms of when working with parents, if we're informed to be able to just allow people to have that, that space to express to change how they identify to ask those questions that's all we can do because unfortunately we kind of can't change society overnight and we can't change some of those horrible and green views but no. we can try and say but this place is safe so i think it is important to be clear that you are providing a non-judgmental safe space because that is not clear for people is it who are because we we have met it in places we weren't expecting. It hasn't been clear which places were safe and which places weren't. So I think that it, it would be important to draw that line for people, wouldn't it, when they come yeah. to see you Completely. quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and one of the ways that I got that on the side, one of the ways that you can do that very simply is if I introduce myself as hi, I'm Neil, I use he, him pronouns. I have yeah. instantly as someone that pronouns are important to acknowledge that importance and I will almost instantly out myself as an ally as someone that recognizes yeah. that um, and the same with the use of the, the pride flag and the progress pride flag on literature if you've got a social media page one simple post that has that flag as an LGBTQ plus person if I'm scrolling your profile I see that oh I already feel a bit safer with you as a person I feel like I at that element of my identity maybe doesn't that's a really good me. idea so what about the rainbow using something as simple as that does yeah, that still I, have I would that say same impact or not 
I would say go as far as to use the, the pride flag or pride potentially flag, I've yeah. got the progress pride flag on one of the following slides, which is okay. a little bit of an update that's come out in the next few years, but it's such a simple way of acknowledging a that's safe Great, place. yeah, I like that, yeah. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Hey, if I just go back to questions, uh, Danielle, I feel like I've been quite ignorant to all the hurdles um, people go within the LGBTQ plus community go through. Thank you so much for the open minds. Oh, thank you so much, Danielle. I think back to I think some people was it Mima used that idea of I don't I don't know what I don't know and I really appreciate when people are willing to give up their time to just hear about the experiences of other people and to kind of recognize wow I never would have thought about that because now you will now there's an extra element to the depth of that thought um, is there anything else you'd like to say on that Danielle just thank you really it's it's I suppose the way I say like I've been a little bit ignorant because I don't judge other people by what they do or religion or race, anything like yeah. that. I suppose yeah. it's quite I've been quite ignorant to the fact of the extent of what the hurdles that people actually go through. Yeah. When I was like I've wrote yeah. notes and like even things that people can bring to therapy um mm. regarding. Yeah um it, it's just it's blown me away obviously I know I knew it was there and I knew things happened yeah. but to the extent yeah. and I just want to thank you so much because there's a lot there that I didn't know about terms um so I'm definitely going to check out the the website for the glossary as well so I just want to say thank you so much because I feel a lot more informed and feel a little bit more confident now I've only ever experienced with one client um and Fun. I actually when I was listening to what you were saying I was like oh right I actually d handled it really really well and hey, was acting as an ally without even realizing, realizing it with like yeah. the technology and how I dealt with because like you were saying about um if the client brings it into the room then obviously mm -hmm. speak about certain mm -hmm. topics then and, and which we did and he he didn't realize that the, when the, his family's reaction to him coming out mm -hmm. um, had such a negative impact on his work. Yes, so absolutely. people pleasing, not yeah, being his true yeah. self. And yeah. so when we explored that, yeah. he brought his coming out story to the session and we really ex absolutely. obviously explored that and his feelings and emotions. So I'm so glad that I actually picked up on that at the time but there's things now that I wish <laughs> I had done differently and that's what you get isn't it when you become more informed and from somebody like yourself who's more knowledgeable and can take that time to teach us so thank you thank you so much Danielle for giving that and it sounds like you did some amazing therapeutic work and like with any client like we always reflect when we learn more about oh I wish I'd have done a bit of that but I I think that how life-changing that I know will have been for that client to be able to explore that impact on their self-worth, their identity and what that meant for them and being given permission to maybe let parts of that go and to challenge that. Um, thank you so much for turning up this evening and for taking so much away from it. Um, okay, Carrie, uh, the video was really hard hit and certainly demonstrated um, some of the thinking uh, that for me would never enter my head as a heterosexual female. My question is about how you think the pandemic might have affected the stats of mental health issues you mentioned, perhaps for those in the LGBTQ plus community that rely on social gathering for support where the lack of uh, familial relationships are lacking in terms of support. Absolutely. A really valid point. Thank you, Carrie. I think that I can speak personally that um, when it sounds trivial, it's like, but when dance was taken away, when clubs were taken away from the LGBTQ class community, a lot of my friends have suffered an awful lot because that was their place to go, to be themselves, to be totally free, to not worry about having to come out to people or offending anybody or censoring themselves. And suddenly having those spaces gone and not having replacement spaces, as kind of adults, it was really detrimental to lots of um, their health, their mental health, and they kind of, uh, some of my friends have gone into counselling, having never considered it before to kind of deal with that, and thankfully they're in a privileged position to be able to do that. I would say for younger LGBT 
plus people. This could be um, really difficult for them to potentially lost the support of friendship groups and to have had that disconnect. Um, and for one client in particular, I think with it was really hard in his mental health because he ended up kind of staying in his room, disconnecting from a lot of his friends and kind of living online and looking at lots of transphobia and looking at lots of horrible things that were going on in the world. And he almost made that his world in a, in a kind of strange way. That's where he ended up living in. And some of the work that we did together was about fostering those healthy connections again and and reaching out to those friends and and checking the reality of the world that he actually lived in versus what he'd constructed in a sense um so i think that like any minority group i think that we are going to see the impact of covid and it's probably going to have hit harder um and we we'll probably haven't even really started to see the kind of the, the wave of that to come is there anything else, Carrie, that you'd like to say on that or comment on? No, I think it was just, it, it became obvious for me um, from my daughter's perspective, <clears throat> who's by, who had just started secondary school. Yeah. And there was a, a, a club that she would go to once a week. And then obviously when the, the schools closed, she lost that yeah. and became really reclusive and literally just slept the summer away. Yeah. Um, so there was that kind of that element that made me consider, you know, it, and literally it just hit me as I was typing. Yeah. It, is that why she became so kind of despondent and reclusive because of the isolation and she was missing that kind of element whilst, as you know, and then 11 coming and going on 12, yeah. she was kind of finding that identity. So there was that element. Yeah. But also I've got um, a, a particular friend who she calls her friendship group, a yeah. very, you know, we're very close knit, um, her water family, because she doesn't really have yeah. her own, um, you know, blood relations that she has mm. any strong connections with. Yeah. So she lost a lot of um, her, although we, you know, we were communicating as we could, yeah. texting, et cetera, it's different than, you know, that girl's night where you get together and get a bit drunk and have a meal and, you know, really get into the shit that's going on in life. Yeah. So there was a lot of that loss. And I thought, you know, for the LGBTQ plus community that really rely on that social gathering to yeah. be their place where they can just be, it must have had a massive impact so I just wanted to check out whether or not you you know kind of thought along the same line so yeah absolutely and I think again thank you for sharing that Carrie I think with with your daughter of, of being at such a, a key age of exploring and starting to ask these questions if if she was able to find some people in her tribe some people that are kind of different it, it's mm. so important to, to us to find like as humans to find people that are like us even if they're different and they don't fit in too um so i don't think you, you're necessarily too far off and maybe that has had an impact that maybe is difficult to share i'm making things up now but it could be difficult to share with you as well because you're you're maybe not perceived as, as being able to understand that element yeah absolutely it's that lack of um, feeling as though somebody can empathize with you and especially, especially mom you know I'm not talking to you you've got to counsel me you know that kind of exactly. <laughs> stuff <laughs> oh, thank you so much for sharing that Carrie thanks Neil um, Dan what's your views on the positive changes being made in the north at the minute uh, can I just clarify what do you mean by in the north Dan uh, north of Ireland Oh, like in Northern Ireland? Yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I'm from the Republic, so ah. um, it, just, it just, you know, obviously when I was back home, um, there was the, you know, the for the, the same-sex marriage yeah. that was going on, and now it's happened, you know, up, up north, so I was just wondering yeah. what your kind of take on it was, and, you know, okay. it, do you feel a bit more comfortable, you know, with, with, with things now, the way it's going? I know it's still not mm -hmm. ideal, but, yeah. you know, there's there's something happening you know definitely i would say that um that i was i was only back a couple of weeks ago i think that belfast as a city center now it kind of to me feels very much like a european city i kind of i wouldn't say that i felt any more or any less safe than i would in say um, manchester kind of the big cruise ships pull in and they like lots of tourists that there's an element that I, I i'm not speaking as authority but of on the surface level, we've made it tourist friendly. <laughs> Come to Northern Ireland where your religion, your sexuality, your race doesn't matter. Um, but 
I kind of was asked the question a lot of times about would I would I move back would I ever consider it and I think my answer would still be no because I think that while on the surface there is progress I think that on a, a deeper and more systemic level it's still there it's ingrained yeah. in the culture kind of my even so like my family as a personal example who Kind of, I've never experienced homophobia from a wider family, but one of my uncles um, is kind of a, a key member in one of the churches and went to every rally possible about taking away gay people's rights and um, about kind of fighting against um, gay marriage and all the rest of it. So on one level, he can accept me, but on another level, would try and take away my protection within the, the country. It, it's, it's perverse in a way, I guess. So I would say that there is progress, but maybe not as much. Not to the same. Like. No, no, because I, I can, you know, because I suppose there was a time when even for myself going up up the north with my accent, you would have had okay. to be a bit, you know, absolutely careful of what what who you were with or who you were mixing with. So I, not on the same level, but I can kind of have a little bit of understanding about what yeah. that must be like on a on a consistent basis. You know, yeah. no matter where you go. So yeah, I think it's been. This has been great today. I um, just want to say thanks again. I am going to have to shoot off. I, I let my son stay up for a little bit extra because I was doing this, but it's kind of, I'm, 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 he's getting away with murder here now. So I'll have to shoot off, but I want to just say thanks again. It's been brilliant. Not a problem. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate giving up your time. Um, okay, I've got probably a minute or two. Let me just scoot through. Uh, and then I will have to let everyone go. Uh, Victoria, I agree, somewhat overly confident, said at the start, how I'd be fine with clients. I had no idea. Yeah, thank you, Victoria, um, for recognising that the kind of the extra that you've taken away. Tracy, I had LGBTQ plus training many times, but it's always good to keep attending training, um, keep hearing updated experience. So, yeah, thank you very much for that, Tracy. Um, Paul, thanks, Neil. I'm off to advocate for my kids because it must be open my eyes. Oh, bless you. Um, I thought I knew, but I didn't, and now I've had an insight. It saddens me. It's been all. Oh, thank you so much for that comment, and please hug them tight. Um, Jane, thank you, Neil. I've learned a lot. I'm shocked by how little I knew. It's been invaluable. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thanks, Neil, for tonight. Thanks for informing I'm going to have to go right. Oh, fab, done. I know I appreciate it. Um, okay, very, uh, just take two more seconds of your time for those are their final tips, just so it's included in the recording as well, is that if you'd like to work with LGBTQ plus clients specifically, I would definitely include them within your bio or your areas that you work with. It's a really clear uh, kind of sign that you're happy and comfortable. Include the progress flag, which is this flag on the right hand side. Um, it's the most up to date flag and the most inclusive flag for um, people of color as well as for trans individuals. Um, if you've got a physical space, if you can put a little sticker in your office as well, um, or your therapy room, it can be really helpful. Um, define your pronouns within your websites um, or social media, such a simple thing. Instagram added it recently. You can have in your little bio what your pronouns are. Add it to your bio as well. It will massively stand out as a helpful piece of being an LGBTQ plus ally. And read more and watch more within the LGBT of LGBTQ plus content. The more you're exposed to, the more you'll understand um, those clients. Particular books at the moment that are quite popular. There's one that um, is really cute. It's called Coming Out Stories by Emma Goswell. I've got a copy here. Um, and it basically is a, a kind of little montage of um, different people's coming out stories and the impact it had on them and how it felt. Um, I love hearing people's stories about their lives and it's like little snippets of that element. Um, Straight Jacket um, by Matthew Todd, um, who is one of the editors, I think, of Attitudes magazine, um, talking about uh, gay shame. And uh, a popular one at the minute that's not necessarily just LGBTQ+, You Will Get Through This Night by Daniel Howell, um, who talks about how coming to terms with his sexuality also helped him to come to terms with his mental health and how to look after it. Um, I'm just going to very quickly flip through the kind of everything we've covered so that people at home, if they're watching afterwards, can pause the video um, just to read over the points. It's just all kind of con condensed into one place. All right, everyone, thank you so very much for giving up your evening and for um, listening in and for taking part. Thank you so much for all the comments that everyone's made. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, if you do have any further questions, if you want anything more, then please um, 
post them on the Facebook page. I can often check that out and respond to anyone. Feel free to contact me directly if there's anything that you want to ask or it links to any more training materials. My understanding is that Chris will send this link out to everyone so you can watch the video afterwards. Um, so hopefully if there's anything you want to go back over, it's there for you. Thanks so much, Dale. It was Fair amazing. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Neil. It was great seeing you again. Oh, thank you. Take care, Shauna. You too. Bye. Bye.